Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. All right. My guest today is Yaron Brook, who is an Israeli-American entrepreneur, writer, and activist. He's an objectivist and the current chairman of the board at the Ayn Rand Institute, where he was executive director from 2000 to 2017. So I invited uh, Yaron on because I had David Sloan Wilson on the podcast, who wrote a novel called Atlas Hugged, uh, which was something of a counter to Ayn Rand's massive tome and uh, considered to be her best novel, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, and he was fairly critical of it. I pushed back a little bit, but uh, the Ayn Rand Institute contacted me and said, hey, how about having somebody on that's pro Ayn Rand? So, okay, I'll talk to anybody, so why not? And uh, so we talk about uh, pretty much all the great issues, Israel and the Middle East, and since he's from there, and how objectivists would handle foreign uh, conflicts like that. Uh, and then that led us to talk about wars and uh, to what extent we have a moral obligation to help people in other countries that, uh, that are by uh, bad luck are just born in these awful countries like Syria. And, um, and then we talk about taxes, the size of government, why conservatives are no more small government uh, at, at all. And, uh, and of course, liberals the, uh, are in favor of big government. And, and what about the welfare state? Don't we have a moral obligation to help people that are, say, homeless and, um, uh, or mentally ill, alcoholics, and so forth? Uh, what about luck, the role that uh, luck plays in how lives turn out? How does an objectivist talk about that? And uh, anyway, so we cover, you know, lots of the hot button issues, the Black Lives Matter movement, reparations, uh, what we owe each other. We drill down right down to the foundation of morality. He and I have a very di def di different definition of morality. Well, his is different than most ethicists as well. But he defends that quite openly. And, and uh, so it was really quite a stimulating two hour conversation. So please enjoy this conversation with Aaron Brook and Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand and objectivism. Thanks for listening. Yaron Brook, thanks for coming on the show. Nice to see you. I've, I don't know if we've met in person. I've seen you a couple times on Dave Rubin's show, and, uh, and maybe I've seen you at Freedom Fest or some of these other conferences. Yeah, we met at a couple of conferences. I think we met at Freedom Fest once in Vegas, and we met, I think, in Mont Pelerin. Were you in Canary Islands? Yes, that's right. Yes, that's where it was. Right. I remember. Yep, yep. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Good, good, good. Well, before we dive into to just, I have a whole boatload of uh, questions I want to ask you. Uh, just give our listeners a little bit of background of, of, of where you're from. I know you were born in Israel and, and you came to America, you went to college here and, and so forth. And then you ended up uh, at the head of the Ayn Rand Institute and, and you have a bunch of other projects going on as well. So just give us a little bit of unauthorized autobiography. Sure. <laughs> sure. As you said, born in Israel, uh, uh, lived there until I was got my served in the military in in, in military intelligence. Then uh, uh, got my undergraduate in civil engineering in in Israel, and then uh, came to the U.S. to get an MBA uh, at the University of Texas in Austin. Stayed on and got a PhD in finance. Was a finance professor at Santa Clara University in California, uh, and uh, and then uh, took on the job of CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute in 2000. Did that for 17 years. Um, I uh, was kicked upstairs to uh, <laughs> chairman of the board, or kicked myself upstairs to chairman of the board in 2017. And uh, uh, since then, I've been doing a, my own uh, podcast, YouTube channel, uh, You Run Brook Show. And uh, at the same time, in parallel, in 1998, I founded a, um, a hedge fund. Uh, and I, so I've been a partner in a hedge fund for the last... Uh, 20 something years. Uh, so, uh, so that, that consumes quite a bit of my time these days. And I live of all places in Puerto Rico. So, um, I think that's the, that's the short version. Oh, wow. How um, did you end up there? <laughs> I mean, really it boiled down to, uh, taxes, uh, getting fed up with the, with the tax load and the, the regulatory load of California and uh, liking the lifestyle out here, but and the fact that I I was no longer CEO of the Iron Institute, so I didn't have to go into work every day. I could work from anywhere in the world. And I looked around and said, as much as I love California, and I really do love California, um, where would be the best place in the world to live? And it turned out for an American citizen 
certainly economically, Puerto Rico is unmatched in terms of the economics uh, that it provides. Even better than Texas? <laughs> no federal taxes. Oh, no federal taxes either at all. Nothing. Okay. Wow. So you, if you structure your life right, there is, uh, you can, you know, if you provide services from Puerto Rico uh, to the U.S. Out, so outside of Puerto Rico, um, you can you can lower your tax rate to uh, basically four percent. How does Puerto Rico pay yeah, for their social all, programs without taxes? Well, Puerto Ricans pay taxes. Oh, yeah, but, okay. It's, you uh, new migrants, if you will, from the U.S. who pay very low taxes. So uh, uh, Puerto Rico uh, taxes its citizens very harshly. I mean, I've, I've been on record saying I don't think it's fair that <laughs> I pay such a low tax and they pay such a high tax. I'd like to see everybody pay a low tax. So mm. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like the Puerto Rican tax authorities to lower everybody's taxes to a flat 10 percent and no federal taxes. And there'd be a flood of people into Puerto Rico. It would be, it would be, it would boom like never before. But uh, nobody listens to me. That's one of the things I've learned in life. You know, uh, uh, certainly the authorities never listen to me. Well, they don't listen to me either. So we're just having a fun conversation, maybe. But <laughs> well, so then I guess the, the argument would be: uh, if everybody paid only ten percent, how would they pay for roads and you know public schools and you know the usual array of you know social institutions? Uh, that we all pay into here. Well, if if right now the institutions that they have are not very good, uh, and uh, you know, part of that I think is the size of the influence and the influence of government. About a third of all people employed in Puerto Rico are employed by the government. Uh, and I would argue that you yeah, I know. Um, take Hong Kong. Hong Kong, 5% uh, of the population is employed by the government, so it has a tiny government in comparison. Uh, it sits on a, a, a very small geographic area. It has more than double the population of Puerto Rico, yet GDP per capita is about three times what it is in Puerto Rico, maybe four times what it is in Puerto Rico. So how do they pay for it? They pay for it by, A, not providing a lot of uh, social welfare, not a lot of providing a lot of these services, only providing those things that they deem as they necessary. I don't think even they are necessary. I think we could have even a smaller government than Hong Kong. But, but uh, you know, Puerto Rico moving towards Hong Kong would be a huge improvement. So uh, privatize the schools, maybe have the government pay through things like uh, education saving accounts, maybe have them pay for the, the, the education, but not run the schools. And therefore, you'd have competition, you'd write down costs drive up quality, everybody would get an education because the government would be willing to backstop anybody who was poor and he couldn't get it. That would be a, a, a transition phase towards total private education. Uh, there are lots of ways in which you could solve all these problems. You know, uh, you go into the DMV to get a, your driver's license, you stand in line in Puerto Rico, the lines are longer, they're less efficient, it's, it's, it's a cumbersome process. Why can't we sit in front of our computers, fill out a form, have the computer take a picture of us, upload all the information to the cloud, have a blockchain process to verify the information and, and make sure that it's correct, and download a driver's license on top phone. You don't need, you need exactly zero government bureaucrats to make that happen. You need some private company to design the software. Uh, it would not be that complicated. It would not be that hard. And you could do that to so many of the so-called necessary government services you could you could privatize them easily um but you know as i said nobody actually listens um now with that in, what, in places what, of what you just described would that scale up to a country the size of the united states absolutely why not i mean w why do we have brick and mortar facilities where you have to go in and somebody has to take a picture of you and submit forms fill them out by hand why can't all of that be automated uh, instantaneously? So uh, there is only one country that actually has automated all these processes, and that's Estonia. Now, Estonia is a much smaller country than the U.S., but I don't think scale is the problem. I mean, look at the scale of Amazon or the scale of Google or the scale of Apple. This is trivial in comparison. This is a tiny little function. 
And imagine if you actually introduced competition and if you actually made driver's license something that insurance companies required in order to give you insurance for your car rather than as a government uh, government man, you know, government entity uh, provided. You could privatize all of these uh, so-called government functions. The only fun- appropriate function of government is the one thing that it is instituted to do, and that is use force. And so uh, government has a monopoly over the use of force. It should have the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force, only in self-defense, only to catch cro- crooks and criminals. That's what it's good at. And then it needs some institutions in order to figure out what are objective laws, what are the right kind of laws, and and uh, how do we protect property rights, what is violence, what is an accident, uh, you know, just the, 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 which is not easy and not simple. So you need a legal system and you need a legislature, but all they should discuss uh, how to protect individual rights, how to protect us from uh, violence and fraud and leave us otherwise free. Uh, the market can solve any other problem that arises. So you're echoing Ayn Rand's uh, ideas largely, uh, and, and there's different labels for these sorts of things. Uh, I mean, uh, already you've you've said we need a state. So you're not an say an anarcho-capitalist that thinks even state functions like contracts, police, fire, military should be privatized. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, you know, you, you could argue about fire. You could argue about certain things, but but absolutely not. I think anarcho-capitalism is a contradiction in terms. I don't think you can have capitalism under anarchy. Anarchy is a state of chaos in which markets don't arise because markets need a rule of law. They need to know that your customer is not going to pull out a gun and take your stuff. There has to be some standard and that has to be uh, uh, some system of objective laws that everybody understands, that everybody knows and that, that people follow. And that if somebody does pull out a gun, there is a mechanism to address that, to take care of that person. So I absolutely think capitalism cannot arise under anarchy. It needs a state, but a, uh, a state that is focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is the protection of rights, the protection of freedom. Right. That sounds relatively simple, but the details uh, mean that there's going to be more and more bureaucrats hired and more agencies for different kinds of things that come up uh, in the complexity of human interactions and especially conflicts. And so you get this almost inevitable growth of government agencies uh, over time. How do you, you know, put a stop to that or slow that growth down? Well, I mean, ideally you put a stop to it. And, and I think here a, a constitution properly written, and I think the founders in America came close but it's a flawed constitution. There's a lot of things that could be written better and could be done better. We, after all, we have 250 years of experience now <laughs> to know what the flaws are and to know how bureaucracies grow and how government intervention increases. I mean, I would focus a constitution on, I mean, there's a lot of things you would have to do in a constitution. A lot of them are already there. But one of the things I would do is have four fundamental separations in the constitution. We already have a separation of church and state. Really, it should be a separation of ideas and state. The, the, the state should not be involved in advocating for any kind of ideas, religious or non-religious. Uh, but then I would have a separation of state from economics. The state should not have economic policy. It should have no economic regulation. It should not get involved in economic decision-making, in business. It should stay out of business, out of regulation, out of uh, any aspect that relates to voluntary transactions between individuals that have an economic nature. Um, I, I, just because of the history, I would add a separation. I would separate the state from education. The state should, in, in, a, in ultimately, have no role in education, no role in setting cu- curriculum, no role in setting standards, certainly no role in actually supposedly educating our kids and, and you know, in, a, in a sense, indoctrinating them into what the state believes are the right ideas. That's part of the separation of ideas from state. And then finally, maybe one that will appeal to you is the um, is separation of state from science. I think the state involvement in science is potentially, and, and in reality, a corrupting influence. I think a lot of the, 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 What's out there in terms of the way grants are given and the way what science is supported and what science is not 
it's been politicized. The Democrats like certain science and hate others. Republicans hate some science and government shouldn't be involved. I mean, uh, it, it should be left to private individuals to fund science. So if you had those four separations and they were clear cut and they were articulated clearly, I think at the very least you would buy time. Hopefully you would actually create a situation where the government couldn't grow because it would have nothing to do. There'd be no things for it to actually engage in. Then how do you solve collective action problems like we need a vaccine? We, we need vaccines because of this you know, global pandemic and or we need an interstate system or, you know, the NASA the, you know, the, you can't count on Jeff Bezos yeah. or or Elon Musk by himself, you know, creating an entire space program and so well, on. Well, well, why not? Why not? So but let's let's start with um, what was the first example vaccines? I mean, uh, I, I think about what a, what a what a world as I projected would look like. There would be insurance companies. They would be heavily motivated to keep their uh, insured healthy, because if you're healthy, you don't you don't actually uh, cost the insurance company anything, right? As you know, if you go to hospital, if you get COVID, if you're not vaccinated, it's very expensive for the insurance company. So, in a market where you actually had insurance companies that were free of all the burden of regulation, free of of all the state control of of um, of state healthcare, which is you know, well over 50 percent of all the dollars spent in the United States on healthcare spent by the government. Uh, so imagine a, a really free economy. Insurance companies would be going to biotech companies and saying, hey, there's this new disease. We need a vaccine. We'll buy in advance X amount of doses. The idea that only government can do that, the idea that only government could care, I think, is 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 dramatically flawed and completely mistaken. Uh, insurance companies, hospitals. Uh, corporations. I, I mean, imagine Amazon has 150,000 employees. They would like to get vaccines quickly. Uh, they could have gone to Moderna and said, hey, we'll buy the first 150,000 vaccines. We'll pay you a premium. Get it to us so we can vaccinate our, our employees. And then, of course, you've got a lot of people who will free ride off of that or semi free ride off of that, right? Amazon will spur Moderna to produce the vaccine. The vaccine will be produced and then Moderna will distribute it to all of us. So, no, I think I think COVID has shown us how incompetent the government is when it comes to crises like COVID. Think about the testing fiasco. Uh, that would have never happened in a private market. Only government could create a fiasco on the scale of what they did with testing in the United States. But even the vaccine distribution was a joke. I mean, there was the, the mechanisms by which they used, the fact that in New York City, they literally trashed vaccines because they couldn't. You know, they couldn't get them fast enough into the arms of the eligible, uh, at least in Israel, where they don't take rules too seriously. At the end of the day, if there were vaccines left, they went out into the streets and said, hey, anybody want a vaccine? And they vaccinated anybody who would come in. In New York, they followed the rules because they were fines. If you vaccinated an ineligible person, whatever the hell that means, you, you, could, you could be fined. So, no, government is incompetent at doing these things, these collective action issues are much better dealt with by collective action under freedom, where individuals participate in a group, um, whether it's health insurance or other some kind of other voluntary uh, corporation, in order to solve a problem. Uh, space, you know, Robert Henlein had a, um, a wonderful story, short story he wrote in the 1950s. This is before NASA. And how we can get to the moon quickly. And his idea was... Um, have a um, basically tell the world that whoever gets to the moon first, whoever private individual gets to the moon first, owns, you know, like a homesteading act. You fence up any territory, it's yours. Imagine if we'd done that and provided uh, an incentive for entrepreneurs. You get all the mining rights, you get all the rights to go from, Mar from, from uh, the moon to Mars, or create competitive, you know, Juice up the competitive juices of of uh, of uh, entrepreneurs and our um, our businessmen. I think we would have got. Uh, I think we would have gone to the moon more effectively. We would have maybe stayed there instead of just coming and leaving. We would have developed all these technologies wonderfully. And again, uh, Jeff Bezos and and uh, and Elon Musk could be much richer because they wouldn't be paying such high taxes and they could be deploying that capital to get us to the Mars faster. So no, I there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, 
private enterprise would get us to the moon more effectively than any other way. Yeah, there's a, a lot of thought experiments going on there. You know, Elon, for example, is a, you know, a, a held up as a model of, of a capitalist entrepreneur. Yet a lot of his money comes from the government. I mean, they they buy. Oh, his, I know. Believe yeah, me. And his cars, you know, Tesla. I have a Tesla, but, you know, it's subsidized. The state of California gave me twenty five hundred bucks and the, the federal government I, I, gave me seventy five hundred bucks. That that's not capitalism. I agree completely. I agree completely. Now, PayPal was capitalism, so you can't begrudge him all his wealth. But certainly Tesla, Tesla is completely crony. Uh, Tesla loses money every every quarter if you take out the, the, the credits, the, the carbon credits they get from the government. Um, and yes, you drive a subsidized car. And, and, and for that matter, you drive a coal car because uh, the, the, uh, the only way to get the electricity into your car is by burning coal or burning natural gas or burning fossil fuels. So you're still burning fossil fuels. Uh, Wait, to drive what? A Tesla. I, I thought just, they, just the electricity the came from the uh, electricity ferry. It's right there it in just, my wall. Just <laughs> I just plug it, it just in. Appears. <laughs> it's fear. Right. It's free. <laughs> it seems that's the way people think about it. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very bizarre. So, yeah, I mean, we, we live in a mixed economy. We live with entrepreneurs who at least some of their wealth are derived from association with government. But to some extent, you have to ask yourself, What's the option in the world in which we live in today where the government has its hands in everything? It regulates everything. It has its hands in all of our pockets. It's very hard to survive as, a, as somebody who does business without having some kind of dealings with the government, whether you like it or not. So the counter is that, you know, without a regulatory state, then people will, um, you know, cheat the system or they'll, um, you know, build subpar uh, housing structures that fall apart if somebody doesn't inspect them and lean on them to do the right thing. So that they, and if they break the law, we punish them or find them and and so on. And or, you know, restaurants or stores will discriminate against people of color, which has happened in the past. And. You know, that's the government's job to get in there and say, you know, as a constitutional right to not be discriminated against. And, you know, had, uh, you know, the you know, the, the second round of civil rights activism followed by state enforcement of those, uh, you know, we'd still be here with Jim Crow laws. Sure. But I think the key to Jim Crow laws and, and to redlining and to uh, most of the kind of systematic racism that existed pre-civil rights was that the government was involved. I mean, it was the government that drew up the lines. It was the government that, you know, subsidized some mortgages, but wouldn't subsidize other mortgages because of racial preferences. And banks and others just followed. And I think that's true in the South as well. Now, there was a lot of racism. I'm not saying there wasn't racism independent of the government. There was. But the solution to racism is not to violate people's rights. I absolutely have a right to discriminate against people, even irrationally, stupidly, immorally, um, in my business. My business is mine. That's the, that's the point of property rights. So I think government intervention there is wrong. It, it, it shouldn't be telling us that we can't dis discriminate in the workplace or can't discriminate in a restaurant um, any more than it should, should be able to tell us that we can't discriminate in our home. Clearly we can. Clearly we do uh, discriminate based on, I, I don't invite communists to my house. I don't invite <laughs> fascists to my house. Um, How do you I know? Discriminate. I Maybe some of your friends person. secretly are, and they're afraid to tell you. <laughs> Maybe they're afraid to tell me, and they should be afraid to tell me. I mean, uh, okay, but you are let, let, instead of the restaurant uh, only serving whites. Let's say it's it's a restaurant today only ser uh, serving non-trans. If you're trans, you can't come in here. You know, of course, people would lose their minds, and the government would step I mean, in. And that so would be horrible. That would be horrible. And I personally would boycott the restaurant, and I wouldn't want to participate, and wouldn't want to. But people have a right to be rational. Otherwise, rights don't mean anything. Uh, just like when you, you, know, you have the right to free speech, and yet a lot of the things that people say we don't like, I find a lot of stuff that people say offensive. Uh, that doesn't allow me to silence them. And any, you know, a lot of business owners do things I don't like, and, and maybe they discriminate in ways I don't like. But that doesn't preclude them from doing it, shouldn't preclude them from doing it. And it doesn't preclude me from saying, I'm boycotting you. I'm not, I'm, and I'm going to put a big sign in front of your thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate, or I'm going to do something to let the world know that you're a rotten human being. You know, so, so again, 
collective action can be done. This kind of idea that we can we can together change something. It can be done without government using force, using a gun. It can be done through voluntary means. And I think the more we rely on government, the dumber we get, the less the less personal responsibility we have. The more we just assign stuff to the government and forget about it, and don't take up causes for ourselves and fight for the things we believe in. So I, you know, I I think government has the the opposite impact. I think the rise more recently of racism, both on the left and the right, is is to some extent kind of a a, a counter to. Uh, years of perceived racism uh, uh, with affirmative action on the one side and uh, and of, uh, you know, on the other side, uh, you know, the fact that there's inequality is perceived as by definition caused by racism without even considering the, the real causes or, or other possible causes of inequality. Do you think slavery would have ended eventually on its own, just fallen into disuse for economic reasons? Or sometimes we need a war. We need the government to come in. Here, your example, sometimes we need a military. Uh, you know, they had to just go in and say, you, or in the case of, I think it was, um, it was it Eisenhower sent the troops in to desegregate the schools, you know, because the Alabama governor said, we're not desegregating the schools Segregate. What was it? Segregation now. Segregation tomorrow. Segregation forever. And so sometimes the government has to come in and say, "We're going to stop what you're doing because this is wrong." So here, some of my uh, free market friends won't like my answer, but the answer is absolutely. Sometimes you need to go to war, and the Civil War was a just war. It was a war to protect the individual rights of Americans. Uh, 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 black slaves were Americans, and their rights deserve to be protected. And the fact that southern states did not protect those rights was a, an abomination, a violation of the at least the, the Declaration of Independence, and I think the spirit of the Constitution. And Lincoln was absolutely right, and one one should have gone to war to end that. And I think Eisenhower sending in the troops when states refused to protect the rights of black Americans uh, is abs- or, or refused to abide by a decision of the Supreme Court is absolutely right. Sometimes. You've got to, I mean, the job of government, the only job of government is to protect individual rights. And if a state violates the rights in egregious ways, then yes, the federal government needs to enter the picture and enforce those rights, enforce the protection of those rights. Yeah, and I assume you would agree that the Revolutionary War was a just war and probably World War II because of uh, the rise of fascism, Hitler and Mussolini and, and, and the Japanese oh. and so on. But then, okay. Uh, certainly uh, the revolution. Yeah. So, so to, to go from there, one of the most just. Wo- okay. Yeah, so the ahead, moment sorry. you set up a system like this, then couldn't you make the same argument for the Korean War and the Vietnam War? These are absolutely necessary. The domino theory. If we don't stop them no. at this small country, they're going to topple over like dominoes, and pretty soon the entire world, except for us, will be communist. And that's a just war, they say. I mean, no. I, I don't. I don't justify any war, and, and even World War II, I would only justify it because we were attacked, and and ultimately Germany declared war on us. I, I'm sympathetic to those who didn't want to enter the war until uh, it was inevitable, until literally we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Um, no, the Korean War was unnecessary. Uh, it's none of our business if Korea wants to is going to become communist or if the communists overrun. It's not our business to be the policeman or the arbiter of what is freedom around the world. Uh, we should be uh, a shining city on the hill in a sense of what freedom is, can be, and let people choose to mimic us or not. And if they don't, tough. You know, it's, it's, it's tough for them more than it is for us. And, uh, you know, Ayn Rand had the perspective, and I think, I think this is the right perspective, that authoritarianism ultimately is a losing strategy. It leads to poverty and it leads to self-destruction. And she, she always thought that while the Soviet Union was clearly an evil empire, it was never really a threat to the United States because it was not an ideology, it was suicidal. And, it was, and, and they would be destroyed if they potentially went to war with us. And second, they were an ideology that had to fail because they went against the very nature of reality, the very nature of man and the very nature of, of reality. 
And indeed, ultimately, they did fail. They, they collapsed uh, basically at their own inertia. We probably helped them survive longer than they should have through detente and feeding them and giving them food. Uh, so, no, you don't have to go to war with every dictator in the world. Dictatorship doesn't spread like a virus. Uh, dictatorship usually collapses on itself without external supports and, and without the sanction of a country like the United States. I mean, all we'd have to do to see dictatorship decline in the world is say, we think dictatorships are evil. We don't want to deal with you, but we're not going to invade you. We're just not going to deal with you. But then we have to be consistent. Then we have to treat the dictatorship in Saudi Arabia just like we treat a communist dictatorship, uh, just like we treat others. And we don't. We, we don't have a foreign policy. It's, it's, it's completely whim-based. It, there's no reason. There's no logic. There's no rationality to the various theories that are advocated today in terms of foreign policy. It's, it's just a mishmash of whatever the emotions that are driving the, the people in the State Department at the time. Or American interests. So with Saudi Arabia, obviously oil, North Korea, we don't care. We don't get anything from them. So we can uh, press economic sanctions on them all we want. It, Hopefully they won't use their nukes. But we can't do that to Saudi I Arabia mean, if, if, <laughs> for obvious reasons. If America interests with it, if America interests with it, first of all, we can right now because the fact is we're, quote, self-sufficient. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oil. Oh, oil that's is, true, right. Oil, oil, but not only that, oil is a global market. It's not like Saudi Arabia could exist if it didn't sell the oil. If we stop, if we said we're not dealing with Saudi Arabia, then they would sell oil to Europe and we would buy oil from somebody else. I mean, oil is a is a, I mean, it's fungible. It's 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 not like we get our oil directly from Saudi Arabia by some path. But beyond that, if we were really about American interests, right? America first, our former uh, president called it. Um, then why did we ever let Saudi Arabia confiscate the oil that uh, French, British, and American oil companies discovered in uh, unclaimed land? And, and since when do we recognize uh, the property rights of a king over his entire kingdom? Why does the king of Saudi Arabia own the oil? I mean, I don't own any oil in Texas, even though I lived in Texas, right? Exxon and Mobile, they own the oil. They, they draw for it, and maybe some landowners in Texas own it. So a property rights respecting government that was truly self-interested, you know, would it recognize the, the, the idea that Saudi Arabia owns the oil? The United States has no self-interested foreign policy. It, it wouldn't know what self-interest is if it hit it in the face. <laughs> I mean, I, we could go on and on and on just with the contradictions, the constant, uh, non-ending contradictions of American foreign policy. You would it's, love it's a the- complete zoo. It makes no sense. You would love John Mueller's new book, The Stupidity of War. I had him on the podcast. He he thinks almost all the wars we've been involved in, except for the three, Revolutionary War, Civil War, and World War II. Just a complete waste of money. That's, I, it, completely. I mean, another, a really dumb one was World War I. Mm-hmm. Right? What was achieved? Tens of thousands of American kids died. And what? We Did we make Europe a more peaceful place? I mean, we just set ourselves up for World War II. So, no, I, I, I agree. Almost all the wars America's have fought, with the exception of those three uh, are, are sacrificial wars. Kids, our kids died for no reason. You know, one of the things I, I say when I talk about war is uh, never advocate for a war you're not willing to look your son in the eye and expect him to volunteer for, right? If, if you're not willing to do that, send your own kid into war. And of course, politicians uh, almost very rarely, particularly this generation, uh, uh, know what war is and know what war is like. I come from a country that is constant war, is in constant war, and I grew up under conditions of constant warfare. Um, you want to avoid it, and, 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 and you want to avoid it unless it's absolutely necessary. And when it is absolutely necessary, you want to win it, and you want to win it quickly. And, uh, you, you know, you, you want to you get on with living, because that should always be the focus. Yeah, well, since uh, we're on that subject and it's in the front page of the news every day, what's the libertarian or objectivist solution to the Middle East crisis? Well, I, I mean, I think the libertarians will be the first ones to tell you that I do not speak for them. Okay. <laughs> and I certainly, don't, you know, so I'm an objectivist, uh, which is different for a variety of reasons we can get into. Uh, and one of them is foreign policy. We, we clearly disagree on foreign policy and we disagree uh, with a lot of. Uh, libertarians. 
on on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Uh, look, I mean, uh, my my view of that is that you've got two very different opposing cultures. You've got a culture which is Israel, which, which has a lot of flaws. Let me just say it outright. I mean, I'm a huge critic of the state of Israel. It's it's for the same reason I'm a critic of the United States and of France and of Germany, of all these countries, they're way too statist, they're way too interventionist, they're way too uh, take away our privacy and all the reasons that we are critical of mixed economies and mixed states. But generally, Israel is in that category of states. It's in the category of relatively, historically speaking, in the world today, good states. They generally protect the individual rights of their citizens, broadly speaking. Um, whether you're an Arab or Jew, your rights are protected within Israel. Uh, it's a civilized country. It's a country that represents, I think, Western civilization and some of the better elements of Western civilization. It's a pro-science country. Uh, it's religious. It's in some ways more secular than the United States, at least that's what I felt when I first came here. Uh, Texas seemed much more religious than Israel did, even though it has very religious people and they often are in the government. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very secular place. It's a Western country, and it, it represents some of the best of what the West has to offer versus the Palestinians who are, who are not, right? They are, uh, they are tribal and collectivist uh, in, in ways uh, that Israel is much more, much more, not quite as much as I'd like, but much more individualistic. They're anti-freedom, anti-rights. Uh, they, they, uh, their political system is authorit authoritarian, whether it's in the Gaza or the uh, Palestinian Authority. They have a president now who 14 years ago won an election, and he was supposed to be, there was supposed to be an election every four years, and yet there hasn't been an election, yet he's still president. Uh, we call that a, a, an authoritarian leader anywhere else. Um, it is a culture that is not particularly pro-science, that is... Uh, has become more religious over the last 20 to 30 years, unfortunately, with the rise of Islamism. Um, and it's a culture of violence. It's a, you know, the, the joke goes, but it's not a joke, it's a reality. That if, if, um, if the Palestinians really wanted peace tomorrow, they would lay down their arms and Israel would sit down with them and they'd cut a deal. They would cut a deal. You mean a two-state solution? If Maybe, maybe it's a one-state solution. You know, I don't know. I, I, I am an advocate of a one-state solution that's rights-respecting uh, because, I, you know, I don't believe in a Jewish state or an Arab state. So ultimately, I think a one... And plus, if you've ever been to Israel, it's a tiny country. Splitting that country into two is a little ridiculous. Um, but, but they come to a solution. They come to something. If there was willingness on both sides, they would come to something. If Israel lay down its arms tomorrow, if they said, okay, we're giving up, we're giving up force like some, some libertarians would like. We're becoming pacifists. Our arms are on the ground. They'd be slaughtered the next day. They'd be pushed into the sea and massacred. And that's all you really need to know. So at the end of the day, Israel is acting in self-defense against an enemy that once it destroyed. I think Israel has been weak in its response. As I said, you need to win wars quickly, sometimes brutally, but you have to win them quickly. Israel refuses to win the war. It constantly plays to stalemates and and to fight another day. Is, so that, right because now, of, hang on, is that because of social pressure from other nations in the UN? And, and if they just did what countries did in the 19th century, just go in, finish it off, be done with it, and the last guy standing wins. And that's not um, acceptable anymore. They should do that. I, I don't think it's as bloody as it sounds if you do it, if you do it properly. They could they could reoccupy and take over the Hamas leadership and, and, and kill them and destroy the entire infrastructure. And they could do that without, you know, massive civilian casualties. But I, I yes, I think it's international pressure. I think it's American pressure, but it's also pressure within Israel. I, I you know, I think that all of this is driven by morality, by ethics. And, and we should talk about morality because, you know, I think it's driven by morality. And the moral code that we all hold, I think, uh, the world holds, and, 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 you know, particularly today more so than in the past, is more and more a kind of a, a Christian um, self-sacrificial moral code, um, standing up for your own values, even for your own life, uh, fighting a war of self-defense in a way that truly defends you and truly ends it. 
is unacceptable. Uh, if you read, you know, I've, I've, I've read a lot of uh, just war theory, uh, people like Walter, who teaches at West Point. It's, it's filled with a kind of a Christian, altruistic, anti-self-interest view of morality that I think cripples our ability to defend ourselves and cripples our ability to, uh, to live successfully. And I think when it applies to war, it leads to what we have now in Gaza, where every five years we'll have a war. Every five years, Israel knocks down the buildings. Then Israel um, helps the United States fund building new buildings because the Biden administration has already said they're going to send money to the Palestine, to, um, to the Gaza Strip to build it. And then five years from now, they'll knock down those buildings again. And Hamas, over, in the meantime, the Hamas leadership will pocket um, what the Arabs call bakshish, which is uh, you know a portion of whatever comes through. The, the, they'll pocket 5% or 10%. They'll continue to get rich, the, the Hamas leadership. They'll use some of that money to buy more missiles, and they'll rebuild the buildings. And everything will start over again, the whole cycle. So, no, you, you have to end it, and you save more lives in the long run by ending it quickly than by letting this go on forever. But that requires a proper conception of self-interest and a proper conception of self-interest in war and a proper conception of self-interest in foreign policy. Uh, I've written uh, about a proper conception of self-interest in war. I did a I did an article critiquing just war theory um, called uh, uh, "Just War Theory Versus uh, um, uh, American Self-Interest." People can find it online. And um, it, but it you know as I said, people in power don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so here's a, another way I conceive of it. But maybe this is overly simplified. You got you know two guys with a piece of paper that's the deed to the same piece of land. And the title company is God, or the holy book, that says, this is our land, and there's no way to adjudicate that. You can't go to the UN or whatever, because it's God that said, this is our land. But that, that would be ridiculous. If that were the case, then I'd agree with you. Then there's no solution to this. But basically what you have, and, and you know, we could get, you know, again, we could spend hours just talking about the history. Basically, you've got a people who came to a land and bought property. Bought property from Arab landowners from the Ottoman Empire, and then found property that was not owned by anybody because ownership is not collective. Arabs didn't own Palestine. Individuals owned pieces of land, and some land wasn't owned by anybody. And they dried swamps, and they brought industry, and they created a thriving agricultural communities, and they built a civilization in a place that didn't have any. It was ruled by the Ottomans. Then there was a war, and the British took it from the Ottomans. And then the British had it. It wasn't owned by the British. It wasn't owned by anybody. And again, there was land bought. A lot of uh, very wealthy Jews from Europe sent money to, to, to what was then Palestine under the British, and they bought parcels of land. And, you know, at some point, the British were going to leave. And the question was, are these two, people, uh, two peoples going to live in peace in this area or not? And look, the history is pretty clear. The Jews basically said, we're willing to live in peace. We're not going to take anybody's land. A one-state solution, two-state solution. When the UN proposed a two-state solution in November of 1947, the Jews went out into the streets and celebrated. They danced. The next day, violence started with the Arabs starting to attack Jewish settlements. And then in May, when the British left and said, you guys handle it, we're out of here. And 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 uh, Ben Gurion, uh, you know, declared the independence of a, of a Jewish state in the UN borders. Israel was attacked by seven Arab armies from seven different countries and defended itself. So, yes, it took land and self defense. They clear nobody has to go to God. Nobody has to go to the Bible. Nobody has to go two thousand years to arbitrate this dispute. This not this is not a religious dispute. This is a dispute about for of two cultures, a culture that is uh, tribal and collectivist and claims rights over stuff that they don't have, and a, and a culture that respects property rights and that, for the most part, bought property. Now, I'm not here going to whitewash certain things that Israel did that are bad, but in the context of what happened and in, in comparison to what the other side did, yeah, they're the good guys and the other side are the bad guys. Okay, related to that, don't we have a moral obligation to help people around the world who are being oppressed? No, we can't help everybody. We can't be the world's entire policeman. But where there's uh, downtrodden people, 
refugees trying to escape Syria, or in the case like in the 90s with the Hutus and the Tutsis, and Clinton didn't act quickly enough. We should have intervened. 800,000 people are dead. You know, don't don't we, as, you know, the richest, most powerful country on earth, have some moral obligation to help people that just by pure bad luck, they happen to be born in, in these crappy countries? The answer is no. Not as a government. Now, you might feel the moral obligation to help them. And I have nothing against it. I certainly uh, feel bad for people stuck in these war zones or, or, or who are born in unfree countries. Great. Uh, uh, provide them charity or send them, uh, send them uh, 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 copies of John Locke's, uh, you know, treaties or, uh, you know, I, I send them copies of Ayn Rand's books. Um, you know, bring them these ideas. And then, of course, I am a supporter of, of ultimately of open immigration, of, of a much more open immigration system than we have today. Um, and yeah, if refugees in Syria, if, if, it, if you decide that you want to help them come to the United States, all the power to you. I don't object to that. Bring them to the United States. We should have a much more open system and they can come here and hopefully thrive in a free country. So, uh, but for the state to make those calls, for the state to oblige me, because I'm paying for it, right? To oblige me in terms of what should be my obligations is wrong. If you have a moral, if you think you have a moral obligation to help somebody, help them. Uh, you know, wonderful. But don't force me. Let's say I don't, I don't want to help the Hootsies and Tootsies. I want to help the North Koreans. My stick is the North Koreans. Yours is the Hootsies Tootsies. Why are you forcing me to participate in what you think is important rather than I can help North Korea. You can help. And, and again, we'd be a lot freer and a lot but richer. I, 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 and I guess the rebuttal would be, uh, I guess the rebuttal would be, I'm just a Go little ahead. guy. What can I do? It takes a, you know, a government size agency to send the troops, you know, the blue helmeted uh, soldiers in to, to, to break up the conflict and, and well, do something I, about it. Well, but I don't, I don't believe the blue soldiers should be sent in. Uh, I mean, it's sad what the Hutsis did to the Tutsis or the other way around. I can't remember, but it, it's tragic. It's a it's horrific. But, uh, you know, it, it, am I going to send my son? I mean, this is, again, the question. Am I going to say your life should be forfeited so that uh, the Hootsies don't slaughter the Tutsis? Sorry. No. I mean, my life, my son, you know, I'm glad uh, he was born in America, a land that's relatively free. Uh, I don't see why that life should be sacrificed for their sake. If you want to if you want to fund help. You want to, if you want to provide them with better ideas so they can ultimately reject violence as a means for settling disputes, great. But a government sending my kid, and always it, it should always be the perspective of my kid, to fight for a war that's not a war of self-defense to protect their families and, and their rights, I, I think that's illegitimate. Now, would something like what I just described uh, uh, have actually happened in 2015 when Angela Merkel said, you know, we got to let these Syrian refugees in. G given our history, we kind of owe it to take care of people that are, uh, you know, suppressed. And, and then look what happened. And now so there's a lot of conservatives saying, yeah, look what happened. Clash of cultures. And now you have a lot of these young Muslim men, uh, you know, attacking uh, Western women and, and, you know, conflicts like that. And they don't buy into the Constitution because they believe in Sharia law or whatever. I'm exaggerating a bit, but you know there is a problem there. Sure. sure. So this is a it, it, this is truly a complicated issue because it it revolves around the fact that there is right now, in a sense, a violent war between certain elements within the Muslim world and the rest of us. They know it's a war. We we pretend there isn't one. And of course, 9/11 was a wake up call to Americans. We've already gone back to sleep. We, 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 we've forgotten about that, and, and Europe has been attacked. So there is something going on here that's more than just immigration, that's more than just refugees leaving a territory. There's actually people who want to commit real offenses. And I put aside the culture, and let's get back to the cultural question, because I think that's an important question that's separate from kind of the, the war that's going on. There is a, 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 I, I won't call it a civilizational war, because I don't think there's a civilization on the other side. I don't I don't think there's you know what what they do to each other in Syria is not civilized. Um, and uh, and I, so I don't think the Islamists represent civilization. But 
I think that needs to be dealt with. And I think, again, if America had its own self-interest in mind, then it would have engaged with this issue after 9-11 in a very different way. And indeed, if it had this issue in mind, maybe we would have never had a 9-11. Maybe we'd have dealt with the issue beforehand. Uh, Americans have been killed by Islamists for a long time, since 1979 at least, uh, and we've done nothing. And, and we appease them and we tolerate them. And, and this is also true about the culture. Look, if, if, you, if you open up the borders and you let them come in and they violate your laws and you say, oh, but they're a different culture, so we don't care, we're going to let them get away with it, then yeah, they're not going to assimilate. They're not going to learn. They're not going to. But if you, if, if, if an if a Arab, uh, I don't know, assaults a woman and you put them in jail the way you would anybody else assaulting a woman and you say to them, this behavior is unacceptable. Our culture does not accept it. You can keep your barbarism at home. This is barbaric. We don't, we've, you know, we have a civilization. And you know what, immigrants, Western civilization, and, and you know, maybe we shouldn't call it Western. Civilization is superior. Anything else you guys have. You want to come here, great. You're going to play by our rules, and you need to assimilate. And if you don't, we're not going to, we're not going to hand you checks. But the West is doing exactly the opposite. It's saying all civilizations are equal. There are no better civilizations than worse civilizations. Um, you know, if you want to treat your women harshly and you want to dress them up in clothes where they can't, where they can't, you know, be seen. All right, you have, you know, it's 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 just the same as the way we treat our women. Um, that is a travesty. And then culturally, we don't defend what's good about our culture. We don't defend what's good about our civilization. When we, we, we don't defend reason versus their faith. We don't defend science versus their mysticism. We don't defend our ideas as right, as correct, versus their ideas, which are not. If we were confident, if we asserted that our civilization was, the, was a good civilization, was the right, you know, we haven't implemented it perfectly. We were, you know, the flaws and everything. But generally, this is the right direction of history, right? And, and uh, then if we were confident in that and assertive in that, they would assimilate. I mean, one of the examples, I think one of the, one of the interesting things that happened uh, during COVID is uh, is the the vaccine that came out of Pfizer is actually a vaccine developed in Germany by a German company, a German company that was founded by two scientists, a husband and wife, both of Turkish origin, whose parents and uh, his parents were I think one of them might have even been born in Turkey, but certainly their parents emigrated from Turkey, and who've assimilated and become Western style scientists who actually developed mRNA technology, and here they are you know, uh, uh, saving the world, right, with the vaccine. So um, I don't buy this. They can't assimilate. I don't buy it. I, it. To the extent that they can't assimilate, it's our fault because we teach them not to assimilate. We should be teaching them the value of and values. Yeah, here you're hinting at this idea of cultural relativism, uh, which people on the left more than the right embrace since postmodernism, that – you can't say that there is a right culture. You can't derive an ought from an is. Uh, who are we to say whether women should wear a burqa or not, and, and so forth. Um, and and therefore, you're imposing your Western imperialist, capitalist, and so on ideas upon other people. So let's just get right into that. How do you know that that's the right culture? How do you derive uh, let's say this idea is better than that idea. Freedom is better than slavery is the easiest one, but, you know, scale up from there. Sure. Well, I mean, you have to have a standard. Uh, and, and I think given that we're human beings, our standard should be human well-being. It, it should be uh, individual human flourishing. Uh, what culture allows individual, uh, in what culture, uh, uh, individuals, successful at uh, flourishing, at uh, achieving things, at pursuing happiness. And uh, clearly some cultures are good at that. Some cultures are terrible at it. And the cultures that are terrible at it are, are bad cultures. The cultures that are good at it are good cultures. Cultures that promote human life. Science is human life promoting. That's why it's good. 
right? Um, it's not good because, hey, it's fun to play these games and to do math on a board and stuff. It's good because it promotes human well-being, because it achieves something. It moves us forward. Um, and uh, cultures that, that negate science, that reject science, for example, you know, modern Islamic culture, because, you know, historically, the Muslims were pretty good with science. Uh, if you go back to, to uh, 1000 uh, AD or, or 1100, I mean, they turned their back on science at around 1200. But up until then, science was happening there when it wasn't happening in the West. So it's um, it's the respect for science, it's the respect for reason, a pro-human life. That's what makes those cultures good. That's the standard. And, and it's easy to measure because all you have to look at is things like life expectancy, quality of life, and, and the ability of people to express themselves in, in a wide variety of different ways. It's what made communism evil and fascism evil. Let's right? just push it, fact one, that one, they let's push it one step further. How do you know that that's what people want? You know, uh, some people don't want it. Some people don't want to be free, right? Some people don't want to be happy. You don't measure uh, the the uh, the goal based on people's emotions. You base it based on reason, based on looking okay, at human beings and so, saying, "Okay, all right." So you're you're starting off with a, a moral foundational starting point using reason what i'm what i'm saying is i think you can go farther Absolutely. than that i think you can do it through empiricism i think you can uh, on average okay. most people would prefer sla uh, freedom over slavery and, and those that say they the prefer to be slaves they just around. don't they what just don't the know let's say it was most people preferred slavery over freedom would you say then slavery is okay because of that so i agree with you in terms of in terms of empiricism but the empiricism is not at the level what people desire because people desire bizarre things and <laughs> you know uh, uh, you, you can look back at the dark ages and say that was a really bad civilization even though people might have desired it because all they knew was jesus and all they knew was god and all they knew was mysticism and they desired that because they didn't have they didn't know anything different uh, but no but we know what is possible to human beings we know what is achievable to human beings we know that empirically because we can look around. We can look at the Dark Ages. We can look at the Renaissance. We can look at the, uh, at the Enlightenment. We can look at today. And we can see a certain progression in terms of the quality of human life. And we can say if people adopt certain ideas, if people reject other ideas, then the quality, the standard, and the length of life increases. That's good. If the standard is human life, that's good. And so it has to start with a moral question. And the fundamental moral question has to be, is individual human life a good thing? And if the answer is no, which maybe some environmentalists will answer no, right? And their standard is the, is the spotted owl or some worm in, in some lake in, in, in Atlanta, who knows? Um, then, yeah, then can't make any of these statements. But it's clear that the answer is yes. Individual human life is good for the individual. And that's the starting point for morality, and it's a starting point for politics, and it's a starting point for cultural evaluation. All right. Let me read to you from uh, Manoush Shafiq's book, What We Owe Each Other, A New Social Contract for a Better Society. I just had her on the podcast a few months ago. She's head of the London School of Economics, professional economist. She was work, worked for the World Bank and, and uh, the IMF and so on. She says... Um, when I refer to the social contract, I mean the partnership between individuals, businesses, civil society, and the state to contribute to a system in which there are collective benefits. You won't like that word, but. <laughs> so then uh, the welfare state. When I refer to the welfare state, I mean the mechanisms for pooling risks and investing in social benefits mediated through the political process and subsequent state action. She referred to it as three quarters piggy bank and one quarter Robin Hood. The insurer of last resort, as it were, is the welfare state. And then here's her summary statement of the new social contract, and then you can respond to this. First, that everyone should be guaranteed the minimum required to live a decent life. This would be your human flourishing and well-being. This minimum should include basic health care, education, benefits associated with work, and a pension that protects against poverty and old age, with the level depending on how much society can afford. Second, everyone should be expected to contribute as much as they can and be given the maximum opportunities to do so with training throughout life 
later retirement ages, and public support for child care so women can work. And third, the provision of minimum protections around some risks, such as sickness, unemployment, and old age, are better shared by society rather than asking individuals, families, or employers to carry them. Okay. Hi. Where do I begin? Right. There's almost there's almost every sentence there is 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 I think wrong morally and wrong economically. Um, society affords. Society doesn't own anything. Society can't afford anything. I can afford stuff. You can afford stuff. Somebody can come at a point of a gun and take our stuff from us, and then they can afford stuff. And maybe you call that person the government in their society. But no, there is no such thing as society affording anything. Individuals can afford certain things. Wealth is a product of individuals. And it's a product of individuals' work and individuals' creativity. What is a decent life? Who is she to tell me what my decent life should be? My decent life actually requires six months of vacation in the Maldives. And a top-of-the-line Mac computer and, and, and an iPhone for me and every one of my kids. Who is she to tell me that's not my decent life? I mean, it's, it's, this is the problem we've had for millennium. Some intellectuals deciding that they can organize society optimally. That they know what's good for you and know what's good for me. And they're going to structure things to create this ideal. It is morally offensive to take away choice from human beings, to take away agency from human beings, not to let human beings decide what they can or cannot do with their life and how to do it with their life. It's morally offensive to say to somebody who's created a fortune, oh no, we, you, we need that money because we, we have other priorities for it. Even though you created it, you made it, you built it, we're going to we have other priorities for that money. We, whoever the we is, we philosopher kings have other priorities for it. It's, it's morally offensive to talk about people as collectives and not as individuals, as if we all share the same standards, the same values, the same, the same uh, things. And that brute force, literally brute force, can be used in order to achieve her vision for society. I mean... One of the beauties of my vision for society, even though I know few agree with it, is that there's no proof force. You, you know, you want to start a commune in my world, you can go with your friends and from each according to ability to each according to his needs. And you can live a miserable, pathetic life, which I know <laughs> you will. But, you know, you can experience it yourself. Empiricism, right? You can teach yourself and you can do it. I won't stop you. But what if I say to her, I don't agree with you about what a decent life is, and I'm not willing to contribute to this project. What happens? Well, a gun comes out. I either contribute or I go to jail. That's wrong. But it's, it's not just that. It's her trying to dictate to poor people what a decent life is. Instead of, and, and assuming also. That okay, produces, hang, hang, and this on, is hang, hang on one second, uh, Yarn. I think a lot of listeners will will, will not understand the, 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 the links between those two statements. If you don't pay your taxes, you'll get a letter from the IRS, and, and then you still don't pay, then you get uh, another letter and then a call, and then pretty soon you, you, you're drug into court or, uh, or you're going to jail for tax fraud and so on, and you say, I, I'm not going to jail, I'm not leaving my house. At some point, they'll send somebody the police or somebody with a gun and they'll say you're coming out and if you say i'm not coming out then then there's they'll shoot you. yeah government is force everything the government says has to happen and you don't do it they will use force against you to collect you you, you don't pay your speeding fine you'll go to court you don't abide by what the court decision somebody will come and put you in jail they will literally physically assault you that is that's the essence of government. And I'm pro, right? I'm for government. Right? I'm not anti, I'm not an anarchist. And yet most of what governments, I don't believe in coercion. I don't believe in government initiating force on human beings. So I don't believe in taxes. So look, it's her model for human existence that she wants to impose on people. And 
she assumes by way, and this is this goes directly to theme of Atlas Shrugged. She assumes that production just happens. Stuff just shows up. And that producers will always produce no matter what her vision is that iPhones are still produced, uh, vaccines are still produced, bioengineering still happens. Even if you take the incentives away, even if you take the freedoms away from people from doing it, where will the jobs come from? I mean, I, I, today we believe in MMT, right? Modern Monetary Theory. So I guess the government just prints money and hires people. But we all know that that's, at the end of the day, voodoo economics. That's, that's nonsense. Somebody has to produce something. But if they stop producing, then you can't afford anything. Uh, and that's what happens in Atlas Shrugged, right? That's the story and, and, and the, one of the models of Atlas Shrugged. If the, if the few people who actually produce the well stop producing it, what do you redistribute? So, no, the morality is completely upset. And by the way, I'll just say this. I think poor people, who everybody seems very concerned about, are far, 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 far better off under a society that has no welfare, under society, welfare from the state, under a society that doesn't regulate, under a society that leaves business alone and leaves us alone. Uh, I think they're far better off, not because of welfare, but not because of, sorry, not because of charity. But because I think they'll have jobs and I think they'll do well. And those people, those few people who truly can't work, who truly cannot take care of themselves, they'll be taken care of by family members, by friends and by charity. And they'll be taken care of more, effective, more effectively and better than anything that the state provides today. Now, one of the uh, comebacks to that is that's what communists say. They say, well, in a in a true communist society, None of these bad things that happened in the Soviet Union would happen because, and then they wave their hands a lot, much like what you were just doing. Well, this is the way it sure. would be. Sure. This is the difference, though. The closer I get to socialism, I'll grant their premise. There's never been a perfect socialist state, right? The closer you get to socialism, the more death, destruction, and starvation you have. Not every social socialist country at the beginning has death and destruction, but it has, the more socialist it is, the poorer it is. It's just, you can, you can trace this over all of history everywhere. The closer you get to capitalism, the richer you become. So Hong Kong, uh, you know, Singapore, you know, we could argue about what Singapore is. Uh, United States in the 19th century, uh, UK in the 19th century. None of them, I will say, none of them are perfect capitalism. But the closer you get, the better human life is. So what would you rather have? What, would you, what do you think the ideal is more likely to manifest itself? In a system that the closer you get to it, people die and people starve and people are poor? Or a system where the closer you get to it, people are better off? And by the way, you know, it, 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 the 19th century in America, particularly the second half of the 19th century, saw maybe the largest migration of people in as a percentage of the population ever in human history. There was no safety net. There was no welfare. There was none of what she argues. And yet, who came from Europe and from other parts of the world? The poorest people, the most oppressed people. I mean, literally, we, our ancestors, I mean, I'm a first generation American, but my cousins, right, Jews from Europe, they came from little shtetls, little villages in Eastern Europe. They, they knew nothing. They were ignorant. They, they were not competent. They were, they were not Nobel Prize winners in physics. These were farmers from little villages in Eastern Europe. They came to America. They, nobody promised them anything. Nobody gave them anything. And so did the Irish, and so did the Italians, and so did the Scots, and so did the English, and so did the Germans in mass. And they came here, and they worked hard, and they made a living for themselves, and they did very, very, very well. So this would and be your response it's to— It's interesting, to, but it to... seems like things have gotten worse under the welfare state, not mm. better. So this would be a rebuttal to people that say, well, the Mexicans and people from Central America are coming here just to get their free welfare checks and free social security system safety net uh, that, in fact, in the 19th century, they came here without any of that. Yes, and, and I would say I don't believe that of the Mexicans and the, the Latin Americans. I don't think they're coming here just for that. If you talk to them, they're coming here for opportunities. They're certainly coming here for economics, but they're coming here for economic opportunities. They're coming for a better life for themselves and their kids. I mean, I, I, the idea that conservatives resent people 
who want their kids to grow up under freedom is a travesty in my view. Um, I mean, we should, we should hail the mothers who cross the Rio Grande pregnant to have a child born in the United States because that child could be born under, in, a, in, in freedom. I mean, that is an act of unbelievable heroism, not an act of, of uh, so, no, then, I, I, then, I don't buy. Then, but but don't then buy why, Yaron, since you've been pounding on the left, let's go to the right in conservatives. Why is it conservatives oh, that are trying to stop right. everybody from coming here? Why are they so anti-immigration? Because the conservatives are, are collectivists. They, they tend to be tribalists. They, they tend to be, there's a, there's a significant xenophobic element on the right. Um, they tend to be nationalist. Uh, but nationalism is often just a disguise for xenophobia. Um, and they tend to be ignorant of economics and they tend to be ignorant of capitalism. The idea that the right, particularly as reflected in conservatism and in the Republican Party, is pro-free markets is absurd. They, uh, they like to regulate, they like to control. Historically, they prefer to control the bedroom and leave the boardroom free. But even that's not true anymore. They, they want to, I mean, if you look at George Bush and if you look at Trump, certainly, they want to control business just as much as they want to control our bedrooms. The left typically has left our bedrooms open, free and have wanted to control our boardrooms. But that's not true anymore of the left either. They now want to control our speech. They want to control. Now they want almost to force us into a relationship we don't, you know, of, of sexual nature we don't want to have. Um, and certainly they want us to, 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 uh, uh, to not say certain things that they find offensive. So I think both political parties now have abandoned all, all pretense of advocating for freedom. Uh, and that's true on the left and on the right, unfortunately. All right, let's talk about Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged, this thin little volume here that anybody could just plow right through in an afternoon. <laughs> uh, why don't liberals and progressives and, and feminists like Ayn Rand? I mean, she's a woman. She's an immigrant from an oppressed minority, Jews. She created strong, independent women that that ran major corporations in, in the United States uh, and had successful, uh, you know, professional careers. And it, it, it almost seems like all those things are trumped by her politics or her, I, I guess, laissez-faire uh, economics and politics. Well, suddenly all of it is trumped by the politics, but I think more fundamentally it's trumped by her views of ethics, her views of morality. Um, I mean, I think that's where Ayn Rand is most revolutionary. I, I think it's where she upsets the status quo the most. Uh, and, I, and I think it's where she uh, she offends both left and right. And she offends the academics. So I think she offends everybody across the board in her view of of what what she called selfishness. You know, you could call rational long term self-interest if you wanted a, a, a better explanatory version of it. But uh, I, I think that's offensive to movements that are dominated by collectivism, by viewing the group as the primary and not the individual, by viewing uh, sacrifice and selflessness as, uh, as your ethical uh, moral duty uh, and, and uh, the essence of morality. So I, I think that's what offends both critics on the left and the right. Of course, uh, she's an advocate of reason and science. Uh, I'd say both on the left and right, reason and science are not particularly popular these days. Uh, she, she's antagonistic towards religion, which is, of course, offends people on the right. Uh, but she was also antagonistic towards a certain secular religions, like uh, what she called the ecology movement and what, what we know today as the environmentalist movement, uh, the placing of the well-being of some mother, nature, mother earth above the well-being of human beings. Um, so she was... A, she was while she portrayed strong women, they were strong individual women. They were women that didn't fight for, an for women's cause. They fought for their own happiness and their own success uh, and their own prosperity. Um, so I, I, think, I think both left and right have many, many reasons to dislike Ayn Rand, and they found all those reasons. But yes, the, the politics, the economics, and the ethics are at the core, and you could even go deeper to the epistemology with the left and the right rejection of reason. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about, you know, you built this corporation, you made that wealth, and then the state wants to take it away from you. Then, so how do you counter the argument? Well, you didn't really do that. Uh, you know, 
luck has a big chance. You know, you, you, you were lucky you had two parents instead of one parent or two parents that were educated and sent you to a nice school, read a lot of books to you, or you grew up in a in, in America rather than Syria, <laughs> or even the, the genetics for uh, wanting to work hard. That is being, you know, high in conscientiousness, high in need of achievement. Not everybody's born with that. All the way down to the stuff Obama talked about with his, you, you didn't build that. You know, the public roads. You drove to the university to get your public education on public roads. Google and Apple both benefit from all of that state, including the Internet itself, which is created by the state. Um, so if you're Hi. walking around with your copy of Atlas Shrugged going, I made my own life. It seems to me a reasonable argument to say, well, not really. You had a lot of help along the way. No, really. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so, you know, it's an insult to somebody like Steve Jobs, who I think came from a single family mother whose father was a, was a Syrian uh, from Syria. So maybe w was born unlucky, but managed to produce a Steve Jobs who uh, dropped out of college, who was not particularly stood out as a, as a young man uh, in any kind of way, did not, I don't know how much his mother read to him or didn't read to him, and, and, and it doesn't matter, because I know a lot of really, really bad people who were born to two parents who read to them, who sent them to good schools, and yet they turned out to be scumbags, you know, and, and, uh, and horrible people. Uh, so... What you know, there's the big there's the big discussion out there in, in psychology, I guess. Nature versus nurture, right? Is it our genes or is it our environment? And what results and you know, the the real uh, revolutionaries think it's a bit of both, you know, it's it's a mixture of the two. And and it seems like the one element that's most important in shaping who you are is 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 is, is does not exist in psychology. Psychology has just eliminated it uh, from reference, and that is you, the choices you make, um, the, the, the choices you make to think or not to think, to focus your mind or not to focus your mind, to do X or to do Y, to take this road or to take that road, the way you use your mind. Do you use your mind, do you apply reason, do you apply your rational mind to the problems you face, or do you just go by emotions and just write it out and see what happens? Um, those are decisions, choices you make, and those choices shape who you become. And if you don't make the choices, then you're shaped by your environment, yes, and you're shaped by your genes. But that's a default. That's the people who don't succeed at anything. They truly don't make anything. They are just products of whatever. But I think most of us, at least most people who are successful in life, did something. They did something. Uh, they contributed. Because I know people who are a lot smarter than me. I don't have, I don't think I have a particularly, you know, extraordinarily high IQ. Um, uh, you know, I know a lot of people smarter than me, less successful. I know a lot of people smarter than me, more successful, you know, but, but what determines that? What determines that is the, what you do with the material you were given. I can't control what parents you have. I just can't. I can't control what genes you have. Not yet. Maybe one day we will, right? But, but. At the end of the day, you get this material, and what do you do with it? Some people make something. I know a lot of people with low IQs who had horrible upbringings, who've made a life for themselves. Now, they're never going to be Steve Jobs. But whatever they, you know, maybe they were a bricklayer, maybe they were an electrician, but they're a good electrician. And they make an effort, and they go to work every day, and they take responsibility for their own lives, and they feed their families. And I know other people in the same circumstances, with the same genes, who don't. So I, I, I don't buy that. Now, let me let me address some of the other issues. Right. So. But but just um, wait. So you're talking here about volition. So you so about you, what volition? About well. volition. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's no so, volition. Why are we even having a, a discussion? Let's go. I mean, there's no point because I because because, uh, you know, I, I love it when Sam Harris says there's no such thing as volition. There's no free will, but you should make the right choices. And here's some choices you should make. Who is, and then he says, by the way, there's no you, there's no me. We're all just conscious, you know, we're all just one. But wait a minute. Wait, what does it mean to choose if there's no me to choose? And what does it mean to choose if I don't have volition? It's, 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 we're just spinning wheels if that's the case. And it's all just a waste of time. I'm having too much 
too much fun to believe it's a it's a, it's a waste of time and that I that I don't actually make choices. And I know I make choices. So it's not really a question. Yeah, I think of it this way. I think all the things I described are true. Uh, you know that I was given a lot of benefits growing up in a middle class family in California, uh, and so on and so forth. And yet, if I don't get up tomorrow and write my next book or my next article, I'm not getting paid. Uh, and at some point, you know, and I make this choice every day. Well, I can go ride my bike or play with my kid and just take the day off, or I can split the time and do some work. Well, I guess I'm going to make a choice. At some point, you do make a choice, and there's nobody giving you anything at that point, no matter how many benefits you've had in the past. How does that would an objectivist respond today to um, the you know the uh, anti-racism, the Black Lives Matter, we're uh, owed reparations, 400 years of slavery and Jim Crow. You whites had all these benefits, uh, you know, and, and generational wealth that gets passed down, and so on and so forth. Uh, how would you respond to that current first, movement? First of all, I don't know who all you whites had all these benefits, who they're referring to, because my white skinned uh, uh, grandparents and great grandparents, if not for luck, would have been wiped out in a Holocaust. I don't know what the luck, you know, what the, these great benefits uh, that at least Jews have had. Uh, that it, So, again, grouping everybody as whites is meaningless. What about whites who emigrated here in the last 10 years? Uh, what about... What about, uh, you know, uh, uh, people that even within Europe were pressed relatively to other whites because Northern Europeans hated Southern Europeans? I mean, the whole collectivist approach is bogus. Look, here's here are facts. Uh, slavery is horrific. It's one of the great evils uh, in the world. And, it, and, and it, you know, it's wonderful that it was eradicated. It's, it's unfortunate that it ever existed. It's sad. It's horrific that it ever existed. The fact is that it was eradicated in the West by rights-respecting countries, in capitalist countries. Capitalism eradicated slavery. Jim Crow is horrible, was horrible, and evil and wrong. And there's no question that slavery and Jim Crow have something to do with the fact that blacks have accumulated less capital financially uh, over generations because they couldn't own property. They uh, couldn't start businesses in some cases. They were clearly oppressed. And, and you know, there was an argument to be made right after the Civil War to give blacks reparations or to give them land or to do something like that. That was the time to do it. Um, but you know what? It's 150 years since then. Um, yes, they're at a disadvantage. The only way I know how to deal with a disadvantage is to work hard. And and to and I think what we do instead in America is we we crippled the black community. We crippled them in two ways. One, uh, since the war on poverty was started, we've institutionalized them into poverty. We hand them a check. We tell them they don't have to worry. We we're taking care of them as if we're, you know, uh, uh, we've got this paternalistic system going on, and they they're children. They can't take care of themselves, and we treat them as children, and we te- treat them as inferior. Do the welfare state. And this is true of all poor people, but it's particularly true of the black community. And then we have leaders who keep telling them that they're victims, that, that they're being treated horribly, that they need reparations because otherwise they can't succeed in life. Imagine if the black community had leaders who told them, go bootstrap yourself, get an education, you know, get A's in your tests. You know, now in some schools in black communities, to be a good student is considered to be white. That's a cultural problem within their communities that they need to solve. Now, there is racism in America. I'm I'm not a denier of it at all. I've seen it. It exists. And it's horrible. There is police brutality in America. There's no question. There's some argument about whether there's police racism, whether there, if there is, let's eradicate it. Let's deal with it. Absolutely. But the problems in the black community are problems that have to do with the welfare state and their own culture. And until they're willing to face their own culture and and until we're willing to face the problems that the welfare state creates, none of this is going to go away. Would a model be uh, what the Jews have gone through for 4,000 years of oppression and anti-Semitism? 
They're excluded from schools, so they said, all right, we'll build our own schools. And so forth. And we build our own schools, and, and, and Jews, Jews um, uh, it, it, of which I guess I'm an honorary member because I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, obviously abandoned the religion completely. Um, but but Jews secular. value <laughs> education. It's in, the, it's in the culture, right? It's in the culture, and therefore, uh, in whatever context, and whatever opportunities they got, they went and they they studied. So th those those people from the shtetls in Eastern Europe didn't were not educated, but they came to America. They made a little bit of money. Now they could send their kids to school. Their kids got an education and they valued it. And you see that today with Asian communities. This is not racism. This is about culture. Uh, and of course, they're being discriminated against. They can't get into Harvard. They can't get into certain schools because they value education. Spend a lot of time, a lot of effort studying. One could argue maybe they study too much for the test rather than actually studying. But the culture is a pro-education culture. If black Americans had a pro-education culture, if that was the essence of their culture, then the, the, the whole nature of the black, black community today in America would be completely different. Now, that is not to deny 100 years, 100 plus years of slavery and Jim Crow laws and the fact that they were set back significantly as individual. But that's just to say, that just means you have to work harder. Just like Jews who came from, from, from uh, horrific backgrounds had to work harder. Just like, for example, Caribbean blacks coming from the Caribbean who are just as poor, um, uh, you know, work hard and, and, and raise themselves up. Or Nigerian uh, blacks who are, it turns out the Nigerians are the most educated um, nationality in the United States. Would a rational argument to reparations be uh, cross-generational or transgenerational guilt is an irrational idea? I didn't do it to you. You weren't a victim. We're talking, you know, four, several generations ago. The moment you go down that path, if you accept that, then don't we owe reparations to the Native Americans? Don't th don't the British owe half the world reparations for colonialism? I see. Well, I mean, you'd, ha you'd have to. You'd have to balance the counts, right? The British also brought a lot of good to the rest of the world. So it's, it's harder. What is the balance? But that's not a debate worth engaging in. I, I mean, do I, do I go to the Egyptian government and ask for reparations? I guess my people built the pyramids. At least that's what, you know, that's what the Bible says. So, uh, no, I mean, it, it, it makes no sense. It goes back to the Israeli-Palestinian question. You can't base claims on ancient history. You've got to deal with reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground today is the generation that enslaved you is not alive. And, uh, it, you know, you don't punish the grandchildren for the grandparents of sin. In this case, great, great grandparents. So it, it, it's wrong. Again, morally, it, it would not help. And look, the other point is this. And I, again, this is not easy to say. And, and a lot of people will be offended by this. But the fact is that just giving money just pouring money into what a, an unhealthy culture is not going to solve the problem. The, the, the black community needs new leadership, new intellectual leadership. And I'm glad to see certain uh, uh, intellectual leaders, you know, Thomas Sowell, obviously, uh, you know, from way back, but uh, who's, who's been around for a long time. But, but there are a bunch of young um, black intellectuals who are advocating for a changed culture. And that's what they need. Their leadership has betrayed them. I would argue the same about the Palestinians. Palestinian leadership has betrayed them. They, they haven't provided them with the guidance to lead them towards a flourishing life, towards a successful life, towards, towards the good. Sometimes you hear the um, parallel argument, well, the, Germany's paying reparations for the Holocaust to Israel uh, and the victims of the Holocaust, the families. It, uh, and, and there, but, but those people are actually alive. I mean, it's, you know, this is, these are current generations, but barely alive. But now I see that Angela Merkel is paying. It should uh, stop. What, uh, it, it should stop. Yeah. It's just, uh, well, I, now I, I see that, that they're, 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 they're sending reparations to one of their co African colonies. I forget the name of it now. There's uh, no end to it. For a century, for a century ago, abuses. Yeah. The moment you open that door. I mean, how many colonies did Germany have? What about Belgian and French and, and British Again, colonies? This is the evil of collectivism. Yeah. You're treating Germans today as if they're morally responsible for the sins of Germans 100 years ago. It's not the same people. 
And just because they happen to be born in the same nationality doesn't make them morally culpable for something somebody else did. And reparations mean money out of my pocket goes to somebody that I did not do anything bad to. <laughs> you know, I'm not responsible for it. So I, I, this is the evil of collectivism and of altruism that Ayn Rand keeps warning us of in her books. Yeah, on that front, I think you, you have a, a PR problem with the word greed. I mean, people think Ayn Rand, they think Gordon Gecko, greed is good. We're, you, you should just be a selfish bastard and let everybody uh, fend for themselves. Uh, and, and, you know, that's kind of what people hear when they hear Atlas Shrugged Ayn Rand. I think, unfortunately, that's true. And, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of people reinforce that by not explaining what Ayn Rand, people who I think should know better, not explaining what Ayn Rand meant by self-interest and meant by selfish. She clearly didn't mean, she clearly didn't mean exploiting other people. Uh, that's very clear in Atlas Shrugged. She clearly didn't mean doing whatever you feel like doing. She clearly didn't mean kind of a subjectivist approach, a morally subjectivist approach to ethics. Uh, she meant doing those things which can scientifically be verified, enhance your life, enhance your flourishing, your, enhance your ultimately your happiness. And that her moral absolutism here is not an absolutism of you must do this, you must do that, don't do that, don't do that. It's about the principles that we empirically discover in the world that lead to success at living. Uh, and those are the things you should do as principles that then you, as an individual, are responsible to applying to certain concretes. So evolutionary theorists, so, uh, evolutionary theorists uh, uh, attack a problem called the problem of altruism. That is, why do... Uh, some or sometimes organisms sacrifice their reproductive success uh, for somebody else. Now, if it's their genetic relations, that makes sense because they they are getting their genes in the next generation by helping two of their siblings, let's say, or four of their step uh, half siblings, and and so forth. Or maybe I help my fellow groupmates because I want to have a reputation of being a good team player, so that when times are hard for me. Uh, you'll remember that I helped you when times were hard for you, so you get reciprocal altruism. Uh, and then from there, you build out to a society. So uh, I wonder how uh, so, uh, Rand would deal with that, that kind of evolutionary problem. So I, I, I don't know, because I don't think that these kind of evolutionary psychological issues were brought up in her time. So I'll just give you my... Yeah, yeah, the yeah, way please, I deal yeah, with them. yeah, please, yeah. Um, I mean, first I'd say that, look... I. I to extrapolate from ants to human beings is a stretch. Uh, even to extrapolate from chimpanzees to human beings, I think, is a stretch. Uh, ants don't have memories. So I don't, you know, they can't remember social relations. That, that doesn't, they're programmed to do a certain things in a certain way. I leave that to science. There's nothing moral and there's nothing we can learn about ethics from ants or from chimpanzees. Because what makes human beings different is volition. We return to volition. And the fact that we do not have programmed into us how to survive. We don't have the means to survive. Um, agriculture is not programmed into us. Even hunting is not programmed into us. We need to discover how to build tools. We need to discover how to do agriculture. We need to discover how to build an iPhone. Those are achievements of reason. They're not achievements of our genetic code. Our genetic code just gives us the capacity, not the content. So when you deal with ethics, you're dealing with something that's uniquely human. Altruism in ethics, which was a term coined by Augustine Comte, the, the French philosopher of the 19th century, is an ethic that says you shouldn't care about yourself in acting ethically. Ethics is about being self less completely if you if you help somebody and you and you have the thought oh i'll feel good by helping them not ethical because you're motivated by some form now it, you know to me that is the essence of evil so you mean my life is not important but some stranger's life is how did that come about my life is mine isn't that the most important thing to me now what does that mean in terms of me treating other people does that mean that I should rob, cheat, lie, steal, or maybe it should mean I just should ignore them, right? The, the isolated individualist who goes out on a desert island. No, of course not. 
Human beings are the one, the greatest source of joy that I can get. Um, whether it's because human beings produce things like iPhones, so that I benefit from. So I, I admire the human beings that built this and made this, and I can then trade with them and get one of them. And I say, whoa, thank you, Apple, for for making it possible for me to have an, uh, to spend a thousand bucks to to do this that is worth many many times a thousand dollars to my life. Uh, whether it's the joy of being able to trade and consume products that other people make, whether it's the fact that I can go and and see Michelangelo's David and be awestruck and have a spiritual experience that is uh, unmatched for me, at least, by experiencing such greatness as a, as a great sculpture, or whether it's sex, or whether it's friendship, or whether it's uh, all the varieties of love that one can imagine. Um, other people are a massive source of value to me. And therefore, why would I be, why would I treat other people badly if there's so much of a potential source to me? Now, if somebody's bad, if I know somebody's going to hurt me, then I am going to stay away from them. I see your, your kids or somebody. Yes, them. yes. My, my son's at the door. He wants, he wants to play. <laughs> I think of it this way, um, yes, that... Um, Genuine morality, uh, of course, I reject the divine command theory because I, too, am an atheist, but a genuine morality can be explained evolutionary that it's not enough for me to pretend that I'm a good person uh, and want to be a, 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 you know, a predictable, loyal uh, group mate and family member or whatever. I actually have to feel it because if I, if I was Machiavellian, psycho, psychopathic and narcissistic, you know, the so-called dark triad traits, um, which most people are, are not, my fellow group mates would catch on to that. So I need to actually feel yeah, good but, about helping you uh, because that's a good thing. And then you feel good about helping me and we have a kind of reciprocity. So this is the evolutionary explanation for the basis of friendships and relationships and so on that yeah. Yeah, you, you actually have to care about other people. But I think you have a completely wrong conception of morality. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Uh, morality is not about how you treat other people. Well, but if you're morality alone on a desert not. island, where's the morality? If you're you by yourself. Morality. morality exists on a desert island. Individual rights don't exist on a desert island, but morality does. Because morality is your responsibility to yourself, to your own life, and to your own capacity to live that life. You're alone on a desert island, you have a fundamental choice. I can sit around and do nothing, or I can actually work to, to, to survive. The moral choice is to work to survive. To use your mind to figure out how to survive. Now, a relationship with other people is an aspect of real of morality because it's an aspect of taking care of yourself. It's an aspect of living, dealing with other people. So you have to have certain principles by which you deal with other people. I, I you know, Ayn Rand called that the, the virtue of justice. You have a virtue that relates to how to deal with other people. You deal with other people based on you know, what they deserve. But this idea that morality is defined as your relationship with other people is, you know, completely accepting kind of a, an almost Christian view of morality, which I think is wrong. It, you know, think of Aristotle. Aristotle doesn't think of morality in those terms. Aristotle thinks of morality as how brave should I be? Not in terms of what it will appear to other people, but how, what does it do for my life, for my eudaimonia, for my ability to be happy? That's the essential. So morality is a code, a, a code of values to, by which you make the important decisions in your life. Decisions about everything important, not just about your relationship with other people. Okay, I was just looking at a so couple I think, of unfortunately, uh, yeah. I think, yeah. unfortunately, this, the, 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 the secular you and, and Harris and, and others – have accepted a far too narrow view of morality uh, that that I think I think limits uh, what you can say about about human behavior from a moral perspective. I, when I see somebody treating people really really nice, but being bad to themselves, here's a question in morality that comes up in the Fountainhead. I'm going to the Fountainhead. Should you pursue a career that you love, that you're passionate about, that you think you'll be good at, or should you do what your mother tells you? That's a moral question. See, I, I don't know. Yeah, question. yeah, yeah. Okay. About you. 
Yeah, so you're defining you morality much. Well, what kind of life do you want to live? That's what morality deals with. What kind of life do you want to live? Not just with other people, but with yourself. And what kind of career you want to have, all of that is a questions of morality. But humans were never isolated individuals. We're always members of a group. No one. I don't want to be isolated. Nobody wants to be isolated. We want to live in a society, but the, we want to live in a society where everybody treats everybody as an end in themselves, as an individual who is life is sacred to themselves and who is living in pursuit of their own happiness and their own uh, fulfillment for their own flourishing and who trade with one another, both spiritually and materially, um, and who then benefit because what is a trade? A trade is a win-win relationship. So we benefit from one another, ever expanding the, 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 the good that exists in the world around them, the good to individuals. But, you know, it's, you can't, the fact that we live in a society, the fact that we've always been in a society, doesn't mean that that is the only thing that matters. It, it's not. You make decisions about your own life every day, and those are the important ones, are moral decisions. That's what morality means. That's what it's meant from the beginning of philosophy. But if, it, it's it, not an it, but if I want to convince you uh, of a certain moral principle that I embrace, I can't appeal to my self-interests uh, over yours. Uh, there's nothing special about the spot I'm standing on because I happen to be standing on it. I have to appeal to you that... Uh, you, you know, that I would want to treat you the way you I want you to treat me. And that's kind of a reciprocity. Put us, yeah, but again, and that's that's the basis morality of morality. Is not just about how we treat other people. If I want to convince you of a moral principle, then what I need to convince you of is that if you if you internalize this principle, if you use this principle in your life, your life will be better. You will have a greater chance of achieving happiness and achieving success in your life. That's what I need to convince you of. Not now, it turns out that one of those principles is you should treat people, you know, well, because people are generally a value to you. But I, I, I'm not saying treat me well because I'll treat you well. Reciprocity is out, right? Because some people treat me pretty badly. So should I treat them badly preemptively? I, the, the key is, why is it in your self-interest to treat generally people who you don't know anything bad about well? Because human beings are valued to you, and I can show you that empirically. Here's the way uh, Pinker puts it. If I appeal to you to do anything that affects me, to get off my foot or tell me the time or not run me over with your car, then I can't do it in a way that privileges my interests over yours, say retaining my right to run you over with my car if I want you to take me seriously. Unless I'm a galactic overlord, I have to state my case in a way that would force me to treat you in kind. I can't act as if my interests are special just because I'm me and you're not, any more than I can persuade you that the spot I'm standing on is a special place in the universe just because I happen to be standing on it and then he and then goes from there to show I don't, th that like Spinoza's- I don't disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. That is a minor point in ethics. That's not the core of morality. All that's saying is that this, they are universal principles, and they are uni I agree that they are universal principles in ethics. There are certain principles that apply just as much to you as to me, no matter where we stand in the, in, in, in the world, uh, that morality is indeed absolute. It's not uh, whatever I feel like. Because, look, I might have a big gun and you might have a small gun, and I might say, I can step on your foot, but you can't step on mine because I'll shoot you if you do. Uh, but we have to get beyond that to what leads to a good life? What leads individuals to live a successful life? Well, you mean individually, but not socially. Like, what makes for a better society? If we expand the what sphere of moral rights to incorporate there everybody... Society, there is no society outside of the, of the individuals in it. When individuals are free and respect the freedom of others, which is called individual rights, when they respect the individual rights of others and they trade with them, and that is the principle then everybody in that society is better off. And the society That's is true. better off. Even, that, even if you want to say, even if you want to say the word society is a metaphor for our collective action, and maybe we don't use that word yeah. collective, but, but it's still something well, that we all benefit. If we, if we adopt something like, and here I'm continuing, 
Spinoza's viewpoint of eternity, the social contract of Hobbes, Rousseau, and Locke, Kant's categorical imperative, Rawls's veil of ignorance, Peter Singer's theory of the expanding circle, the optimistic proposal that our moral sense, though shaped by evolution to overvalue self, kin, and clan, can propel us on a path of moral progress as our reasoning forces us to generalize it to larger and larger circles of sentient beings. I love Steven Pinker, but it's it's nonsense. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's it's just not. It's just not. It's it's just not. That's not the basis for a moral code in which people are free. What you need to convince people of, in terms of social relationships, because it, 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 he gives an example there. He gives Peter Singer as an example. Peter Singer wants to stand on my foot, stick his hand in my pocket, take my wealth, and redistribute it in mass. He wants to use violence, which Pinker is against, right? Pinker is, is, is anti-violence, except when the state engages in violence, and then Pinker's fine with state violence, as long as it's only monetary in the form of taxation, because Pinker tends to be on the left economically. No, I'm sorry, this is, you have to have a principle, and the principle is that in a social environment, I cannot infringe on your right to act in your pursuit of your values. That's the social principle that binds a society. That's what capitalism is. That's what freedom means. Morality is something else. This is, le this is a principle that is derived from a particular moral code. But first, you need a moral code of individualism. First, you need a moral code that says individuals pursuing their happiness is a good thing, that happiness is the goal of morality, that we need principles in order to attain uh, uh, happiness. And therefore, Individuals must be left free so that they can attain their moral purpose in life, which is their happiness. And that's where all of you need Ayn Rand. I mean, you really do, because <laughs> she actually solved this problem of linking is and ought in a scientific way and presented a morality of individualism that is consistent with freedom. <laughs> and it's sad that, that there's so much resistance to this idea of self-interest as articulated by Ayn Rand, because I think it's the key to solving many of our problems. Yes, I do start off with the, uh, uh, let's see, where do I have it here? Uh, as the, the individual as the moral unit of, of, with which yes. we must begin. And here's Absolutely. what I here's what I write in the moral arc. Um, it is the individual who's the primary moral target, not the group, tribe, race, gender, state, nation, empire, society, or any other collective, because it is the individual who survives and flourishes or who suffers and dies. It is indi individual sentient beings who perceive, emote, respond, love, feel, and suffer, not populations, races, genders, groups, or nations. Historically, historically immoral abuses have been most rampant, and body counts have run the highest when the individual is sacrificed for the good of the group. It happens when people are judged by the color of their skin or by their XY chromosomes or by who they prefer to sleep with or by what accent they speak with or by which political or religious group they belong to and so on and so forth. So and I say the rights revolutions of the past three centuries have focused almost entirely on the freedom and autonomy of individuals, not collectives, on the rights of persons, not groups. Individuals vote, not races and genders and so on. I agree completely with all of that. We agree completely on that. And now we need to take it one devil deeper and say, okay, morality is about a, a, a set of principles to, to help an individual guide his life. It's a map to help him guide his life towards success, towards flourishing, towards lack of pain, towards happiness. That's what morality is about. And one aspect of that is his relationship with other people. And that relationship with other people should be mutually beneficial. Uh, you, sh you should get off my toe because it's good for you to get off my toe for a variety <laughs> of reasons, which I can. OK. All right. I, I, uh, I sent you that essay I wrote way back in the day, uh, the unlikeliest cult in history. So and you can respond to this. I'm, I'm sure it's a softball question for you. But here's what I wrote. The fallacy in objectivism is the belief that absolute knowledge and final truths are attainable through reason. And therefore, there can be absolute right and wrong knowledge and absolute moral and immoral thought and action. For objectivists, once a principle is discovered through reason to be true, with a capital T, that's the end of the discussion. If you disagree with the principle, then your reasoning is flawed. If your reasoning is flawed, it can be corrected, but if it's not, you remain flawed and do not belong in the group. Excommunication is the final step for such unreformed heretics. Nathaniel Brandon, Rand's chosen intellectual heir, 
where, where he listed the central tenets to which the followers were to adhere, including, quote, Ayn Rand is the greatest human being who's ever lived. Atlas Shrugged is the greatest human achievement in the history of the world. Ayn Rand, by virtue of her philosophical genius, is the supreme arbiter in any issue pertaining to what is rational, moral, or appropriate to man's life on earth. No one could be a good objectivist who does not admire Ayn Rand, admires, and condemn what Ayn Rand condemns. No one can be a fully consistent individualist who disagrees with Ayn Rand on any fundamental issue. Now, to be fair, uh, you know, Brandon was, you know, heavily involved in that whole uh, group emotionally. Yeah. So, you know, uh, but how do you respond? Because that's a common, uh, you know, theme you hear. Oh, objectivism is a cult. It's like a religion. It's like Christianity. I consider I consider that ridiculous. I mean, look, um, I mean, the biggest problem I have with your essay with regard to this is that it it relies on two sources, both of whom of whom broke with Ayn Rand, both of whom dedicated their lives to to smearing her and to presenting her in a in a in an ugly manner. So yeah, I mean, those books are not objective. The the Nathaniel Brand, I've been in this movement, right? Uh, you know, I read Ayn Rand when I was sixteen. I didn't know there was anybody else on planet Earth who'd read her because I was in Israel at the time and uh, there was no internet. There was there was nothing. Right. So it took me. To, I, I got every every book of hers. It took me three years before I discovered another person who liked Ayn Rand. Right. I was the CEO, CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. Um, I've been in the movement forever. Right? Now, I didn't meet Ayn Rand and I wasn't part of that circle. None of that is true of my experience within the objectivist movement. There's no eight commandments. We, nobody signed a secret deal. When I became CEO, they didn't sit, the board didn't seat me down and say, do you now think that Ayn Rand is the greatest human being who's ever lived? I mean, that is absurd. Uh, if you know, none of that ever happened. None of them happens. Now, I don't know what Nathaniel Brandon did. Nathaniel Brandon strikes me as a cultish figure. Um, so, and, and reading his book, about Ayn Rand and about those years, my takeaway was he was a bad dude and he did some bad things back then, both to Ayn Rand, but to the movement as well. And I think he did a lot of damage to the movement. And part of that damage was that he treated Ayn Rand like a cult leader and encouraged people around him to do so. But I, 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 you know, I don't believe it was a cult then. It's certainly not a cult today. Now, with regard to excommunication, Every intellectual movement under the sun <laughs> has done this. Yeah, <laughs> people disagree, and because we're intellectuals, we care about ideas. And if you disagree with me about an idea, then we're not allies anymore in some circumstances, right? And in, in, in certain disagreements, like it reminds me, the libertarians always make fun of objectivists. You guys have schisms all the time. Well, what do libertarians do all the time? <laughs> they constantly have schisms, right? I know. Whole think tanks that don't talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the two guys who founded public choice theory spent 40 years not speaking to one another, even though they founded the theory together, right? And they were good friends from the beginning. So no, don't give me this. <laughs> this is a, a this is part of being an intellectual. We take ideas seriously. And then there are people in the movement who do bad things. The you know, maybe they like Stephen Chill and then they're kicked out. Is that you know, shouldn't we kick them out? You'd fire them from a corporation. Uh, the people in the movement who spin off because we have disagreements about what the philosophy means. So it's not like we shoot them. We say, we disagree. We're going to do our thing at the Einstein Institute. You go do your thing over there. And we're going to say you're wrong. And you're going to say we're wrong. Okay. I mean, intellectual disagreements exist. Um, so it's I, you know, it's as if we objectivists are held to a standard that yeah. nobody else is held yeah. up to. Yeah. But believe me, I mean, we've had campus clubs. We have thousands of kids all over the world today. We have we some of our most active um, uh, participants are in Latin America and in Eastern Europe and in, all over the world. And we don't have some rigorous dogma that they have to sign off of. Now, all that said, Ayn Rand. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular philosophy that she wrote. She made it very specific that she said, my philosophy, the stuff I wrote, I call it objectivism. People will develop it. People might even find uh, disagreements with it. People might find flaws in it and correct those flaws. All I ask is that you don't call that objectivism. Objectivism is what I created. I wanted to maintain that. 
you call it something else. Call it, you know, I think at the end it'll be called Randism or something like that, you know, based on Rand. But just keep what I created as a whole because she saw that in the past, people's writings were distorted by their followers, were perverted, were, and she wanted her writings to have that name, to have that. That's the only sense in which it's a closed system. Truth, with a capital T or a lower T, doesn't matter. It's not a closed system. Truth is an open system. And, and I tell people, I don't care if you're an objectivist or not. What I care is, are you a truth seeker? I want truth seekers. I think if you're a truth seeker, you'll find truth in objectivism, uh, in much of it, in all of it, because I think it is a system that kind of stands together. But what's important to me is that we're focused on reality and on discovering the truth. And um, that is what it's about. That's not an attitude of a cult, right? I, so I was trained by the Ayn Rand Institute, right? I took courses there. I took graduate seminars there. Never did I sign an oath of alliance, allegiance. Never was I tested about whether I like Beethoven or not. I mean, that's the other ridiculous thing, right? Uh, uh, Ayn Rand threw people out because they disagreed with her about Beethoven. No, that's just not true. I, you know, I'm friends with Leonard Peikoff, who was her student. Leonard likes Beethoven. Ayn Rand didn't. And Leonard was close to her for 30 years. Leonard, I've even been to an opera by Wagner with Leonard, right? Um, if you read other people's accounts of Ayn Rand, not the Brandons, uh, Marianne Suez has an account. There's a, a book that we put out called The uh, 100 Voices, where we just interviewed 100 people about stories about Ayn Rand. You get a completely different view of Ayn and, and how she lived and what she was like and the fact that she disagreed about movies. And you quote in the article, I thought that was interesting, uh, somebody who liked Richard Strauss and then uh, when he left, Ayn Rand said, now I understand why I can never be a soulmate with that person. I mean, to me, that's a completely reasonable thing. Our response to art does reflect something about deep about who we are and what we are. She didn't say excommunicate him. She didn't say... He's no good a thing. He's not a good thinker. He's irrational. He's immoral. She said, "We just don't connect at some level. We're never going to connect at some level because there's something about his sense of life and my sense of life that doesn't match." That is a super reasonable thing to say, and and an honest thing to say. Now, if she condemned him morally for liking Richard Strauss, then you know you, you would have a point. But well, that's true. We all do that. Anyway. I mean, there's certain people that. I don't know. I had, I grew up with and went to college with a, a friend who was a pretty hardcore born again evangelical Christian, which I was for a while. But then when I became an atheist, then that's all he wanted to talk about. And it's like, well, you know, it just gets burdensome for a while because it's not my thing anymore. You know, so I understand, and I, I, it, it, and I think we're on let, the same page admit, on the, on the on the truth seeking. Uh, that's the tribe yes. we want to belong to. The collective is the the group that seeks the truth, regardless of you know where it leads. So. I, let, let, let's exactly, just as individuals, and let me just and let me just say, they are objectivists who are obnoxious. There are people who call themselves objectivists who are obnoxious to other people who are who treat objectivism as a religion or who don't understand parts of it and yet pound the pavement on it. And I was probably obnoxious when I was 20, 21, 22, 25. I hope I've outgrown it. Um, and, and, but you know, but that don't judge Ayn Rand. And don't judge ideas based on the worst advocates for those ideas, based on their worst representatives. Uh, judge the ideas for yourself. Read Atlas Shrugged. Read The Virtue of Selfishness. Read Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And judge the ideas for what they represent and what they stand for. And, um, you know, my, I, I think that if more people are exposed to her as a philosopher, as a, not just as a novelist, but as, as somebody who, who wrote uh, important about important ideas that can affect individuals' lives and affect society. Uh, you know, I think uh, I, I think the world will be a better place. The more people read her, and the more people consider her, and the more the more she is part of the debate and the discussion out there. You know, you hear this meme that uh, you know people read Atlas Shrugged in their late teens, early twenties, and and they get highly energized about it. But no one in their thirties, forties, and fifties, you know, because they're mature, they've moved past this. Is that even true? Is there any data or people who just just uh, spitballing ideas there. Sure. No, there's truth to that. I mean, I think, I think uh, she's particularly popular uh, in in the teenage, early twenties, and then people drift away from it. And and my view is that she, you know, people respond to the idealism in Ayn Rand. 
right? The projection of an ideal man, an ideal society. And when we're young, we're idealistic, right? The hormones kick in. This is where evolution plays a role, right? We're looking for our own for truth. We're not, we're not going to accept what our parents tell us. We're not going to accept the teachers. We don't listen to priests. We're out there searching. And Ayn Rand appeals, it appeals to those people. Now, some of them hold on to that idealism. I'm certainly one of those people. I hold on to those ideals. I never gave them up. Others succumb to society, I think. Uh, there are many pressures in society to conform, to think like everybody else, to come to Shabbat dinner and pretend that you're religious or adopt religion, uh, and to give up on your individuality. I mean, this is the core of morality in my view. Can you hold on to what makes you, you? Can you hold on to your unique values or do you conform with everybody else? That's an essential question in morality. And I think most people give up. Most people uh, are immoral in that sense. They, they conform, they give up their own ideals, they walk away. And in that sense, yes, I think a lot of people walk away uh, from Ayn Rand, not because they grow out of it, but because they grow out of idealism. They grow out of, 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 of ambition. Uh, maybe they're still ambitious for money, Maybe it's still ambitious for career, but they grow up, grow out of ambition for building their own soul and for making their soul the best that it can be. Because that's what I think Ayn Rand inspires a person to do, is to be the best that you can be, not just materially, but primarily spiritually, in, in, a, in, a, in the secular sense of spiritually. That is be the best human being you can be for you. You know, uh, and that's what her morality teaches. It teaches you to, to focus on being a good person, which means engaging with the truth and being focused on the truth. That's Ayn Rand's morality. Well, Yaron, we've been going almost, we'll be going over two hours now. I This came about yes. because, you know, I had David Sloan Wilson on. He wrote that novel, Atlas Hugged, <laughs> and the Ayn Rand Institute contacted me and said, hey, you should have somebody on that, you know, that, that presents a proposition. But I have to say, when I read uh, David, the following passage from Atlas Shrugged, his response was, oh, my God, I totally uh, am inspired by that. This is from John Galt's speech. In the name of the best within you, do not sacrifice this world to those who are its worst. In the name of the values that keep you alive, do not let your vision of man be distorted by the ugly, the cowardly, the mindless, and those who have never achieved his title. Do not lose your knowledge that man's proper estate is an upright posture, an intransigent mind, and a step that travels unlimited roads. Do not let your fire go out, sparked by irreplaceable spark, in the ho hopeless swamps of the approximate, the not quite, the not yet, the not at all. Do not let the hero in your soul perish in lonely frustration for the life you deserved, but have never been able to reach. Check your road and the nature of your battle. The world you desired can be won. It exists. It is real. It is possible. It is yours. That is inspirational. Who would not beautiful. like that? That is beautiful on so many levels, and it's, it's truly inspirational. Um, and, you know, I'm not surprised. He was inspired when you read it because, I, you know, given his what I've read from his book, he didn't read Atlas Shrugged. So uh, I don't know how he wrote some of what he wrote if you if he actually read Atlas Shrugged. So. Well, you're on. Thanks for um, so much for coming on and, and uh, enlightening us pleasure. on objectivism and Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged and so forth. Great conversation to be continued because I didn't ask you half the issues that are hot button today. Uh, so we'll cover that in, a, in another episode. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Are you going to be in Grand Rapids in uh, in uh, South Dakota? Oh yes, I'm going there. Yes, yes, to uh, for Freedom Fest this summer. Y'all be there, so I'll see you there. I'll see you there. Absolutely, that'll be fun. Thanks, Mike.